So our next speaker is uh, fairly new. Um, Drew Ricketts is taking over for uh, Charlie Lee. I think Drew, if I'm not mistaken, you had worked under Charlie uh, for the last several years and uh, have just slid right in and hit the ground running. Uh, I know he has worked with K-State, uh, the Weldon Master Gardener program. He had a three-hour program uh, through that. Um, but tonight, he's going to talk to us about uh, whitetail deer and uh, more importantly, maybe food plots there. So, uh, Drew, if you want to start, yep, you're going to start sharing your screen. And if you have anything to add to my introduction, feel free. Oh, that, that was a good job. I appreciate it. And are you all seeing the correct screen? You're not seeing my, my viewer screen? Absolutely. Yes, sir. All right. Perfect. So today um, I'm going to be talking about whitetail deer. Food plots was, was the topic I was asked to present on, but typically there is a lot of uh, misunderstandings about uh, what's needed by deer and, and those sorts of things. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, on whitetail deer nutrition, um, and then we'll, we'll finish with food plots. So just to get started, um, you know, a lot of people equate food plot management with habitat management. And it's really, really important, I think, to reinforce that food is just one part of habitat for wildlife. You know, there's four main components, food, cover, water, and space. And it's very, very important when we're going to manage habitat to identify the limiting factor for our population. And so that's basically uh, the, the, the component of habitat that is establishing the carrying capacity for an area for whatever critter we're interested in. So you, you can think of it like the, the smallest slat in a barrel, you know, wh whichever slat is the lowest determines how much water that barrel can hold. Whichever component of habitat is most limiting is actually what's what's limiting our populations and probably driving things like um, antler size and that sort of thing in deer. So to be successful in managing wildlife, you got to find that limiting factor. And the reality is when we're talking about whitetail deer, and especially in eastern Kansas, food is rarely the limiting factor when you're in that mosaic of rangeland and woodlands and agriculture that, that we have in the eastern part of the state and really throughout most of the state. So I'm not going to talk a lot about identifying limiting factors and, and other habitat management practices, but this is, this is the tool that I use. I've got a PhD in wildlife biology. We've got a $2 million deer research project in western Kansas right now that I'm, I'm heavily involved in. And when, when I go to a property to try and figure out what the limiting factor is, I bring this tool with me. It's, it's the wild, Whitetail Deer Wildlife Habitat Evaluation Guide. Um, and in the, the, the book itself or the, the guide itself is basically a description of, of the whitetail deer biology, uh, food habits, all that sort of thing, their habitat requirements. And then it's got this evaluation tool that I'm just showing one page of that helps you identify your limiting factors. Really, really important step in any property management uh, plan. All right, so thinking about deer food and, and what deer eat and all those sorts of things, we first have to start with their physiology. So they're concentrate selectors. They're not bulk foragers like cattle. And so that means that they've got a small rumen. The stuff that they eat doesn't stay in that rumen very long. They need really nutrient dense, easily digestible forage. And they have a very limited ability to digest things like plant fibers and cell walls that are very, very common in a lot of the things that cattle eat, like grasses. They're adapted to be very selective. So they've got that agile tongue and a very narrow muzzle. Uh, we can see that narrow muzzle here on this young buck. And that's really important because they, they typically eat parts of plants. They don't consume whole plants. They don't get as much as they can. They, they, they select those highly nutritious new growth sorts of things. They may consume 100 species per year, however. So they're very selective. Um, but 
they they still have a very very broad diet and they also have uh, an enzyme in their saliva that allows them to select foods that are really high in tannins that that many other species can't so that's how their physiology plays into what they can eat so now let's move on to nutrients, which is gonna be sort of a, a longer section of this talk and, and, and a big focus. So deer retri- require nutrients from water, energy, or what we call macronutrients. Those macronutrients are the things that we probably think about the most when we're thinking about managing for food for deer would be protein, carbohydrates, and lipids and fats. They also need some micronutrients and those micronutrients are minerals and vitamins. So if we're thinking about water and making sure we have enough water on a property, in eastern Kansas, this isn't typically a problem. You know, there's parts of eastern Kansas where you might have several ponds on a quarter section. In lots of other parts of the state, that's not true. But as long as you've got a pond or a creek that has water in it all the time, every half mile or so, then you're going to have plenty of water for deer. So let's move on to nutrients. So we'll first start off with protein. We're gonna see four graphs like this, I believe. So we've got monthly protein, and this is optimal, the the, basically the maximum that they need during each month of the year. And we've got females or does in pink and bucks or males in blue. And then below each month, we can see which biological period of importance that is for for bucks or does. So in in January, um, bucks are in their maintenance period, which is a time of year when they don't necessarily need a lot of nutrients. And does are are gestating, so they may need more. And the big takeaway here is that there's each sex of deer has different peak times that they need protein and the time that they both need the most is during summer when bucks are growing antlers and when does are are either in that late gestation period or when they're lactating and for protein as long as you've got 16 percent on average in the deer forages that are out there you're supplying them every bit of protein that they need at all. Move on to energy. So same sort of graph, pinks, does, blues, bucks. And we don't see near as much of a fluctuation or or a seasonal change in energy demands. But we do see that, you know, of course, rut is the, the peak energy time for bucks. And then lactation is gonna be that peak energy demand for does. Move on to minerals. Calcium is an important mineral. It's it's very important for bucks that are and they're going to have the the highest demand for calcium during that antler growth period. So this is 0.14%. So not not a whole not a big component of their food, but it's still important. So calcium's very very important during that antler growth period for bucks and also during lactation for does. Phosphorus is our other big mineral that that we think about a lot. Relatively constant phosphorus demands for does um, throughout gestation and when they are producing milk. But bucks have this huge peak because it's very, very important for antler growth. Phosphorus also plays a very big role in production of bone and production of teeth as well. Vitamins, so so this is something that we know much less about. Um, Vitamin A, it's important for antler hardening, but it's converted from carotene in green leaves. So they should be getting all the vitamin A that they need. Vitamin D promotes calcium absorption and mineralization. So it's important for, you know, the hardening of their antlers and their teeth and their bones. But the requirements of this are met by sunlight. Vitamin E prevents muscle and tissue damage and promotes healing when we have in, in, injuries. It's going to be in high fat foods like sunflower seeds, turnip greens, alfalfa, and also in cool season grasses. And there's a whole lot of research that's needed on this topic, but it's very, very difficult to do 
with wild populations. So, you know, the little bit that we do know about this comes from pen raised deer, not wild deer. So let's move on to talk about where wild deer get these nutrients from. And we're gonna be using three main publications to, to get this information from. You're gonna see me reference Guy et al. and Stevens et al. These two are both Noble Foundation publications. So this is down in the Cross Timbers region of Southern Oklahoma and North Texas. Very similar environment to the Chautauqua Hills that, that you'd run into down around Fredonia. Um, this is actually the, the closest diet data for deer that we have to this part of the country. Both of these publications are, are freely available on the internet and, and they're, they're kind of like extension publications. They're, they're geared towards landowners and have tons of useful information in them. The other big source for, the, for a lot of this food data is Harper 2019. So this is a, a very new book, uh, Wildlife Food Plots and Early Successional Plants. I use this book all the time. Uh, it's, it's a very, very good book. It's sort of the Bible for food plots. It's also a Bible for um, early successional plants that are important for wildlife. And it even has an identification guide in the back of it for those plants. So you're gonna see me reference these publications a lot. So what do deer eat? Well, they're browsers mostly. So 46% of their diet, if we look at the average of 70 studies from, from the Northern United States all the way down to the Gulf Coast, we see that browse is that main component making up 46% of their diet. Browse is leaves, twigs, and bark from woody plants. So think, think that that new growth or, or last year's growth on woody plants, and, and that includes not just trees, but also shrubs and vines. Forbs are, are the next very important component at 24%. So forbs, we're talking about broadleaf plants. Most of them that I'm gonna talk about today, you probably think of as weeds. Mast is nuts and fruit. So also an important component of diet, lots and lots of energy comes from mast um, from different species of woody plants. Grass is a minor component at 8%. It's typically gonna be cool season grasses that are consumed, but, but we're not talking about cool season grasses that cattle typically eat. We're talking more about cool season grasses like wheat and oats and rye that are cereal grains. And then um, some, some of the, the ice cream grasses that, that we don't talk about a whole lot that would be native out in, out in rangelands like some of the small panicums and things like that. Crops, about 4% of that diet. Cactus, probably don't have a lot of deer eating, cac eating much cactus in Kansas, but maybe some. 2%, fungus. 2% and then other making up 3%. So deer are browsers. That's the most important component to their diet. And then the next most important component is forbs. So what are some important browse species that they found in this study down in central and southern Oklahoma that we have here in Kansas? Well, there's four main species that were found in the, in the diets of deer that were harvested down there, or excuse me, in the stomach contents of deer that were harvested in this study that we have a lot of. And these species were selected in four out of the four seasons with the exception of buckbrush, which was selected in three of the four seasons. So Osage orange, or hedge trees, the sumac and poison ivy complex. So here we're talking about smooth sumac, uh, fragrant sumac and poison ivy. And then oaks. So again, sumac, oak, hedge trees, and buckbrush. So that was spring and summer. And now we're moving into fall and winter. Again, buckbrush, oaks. Now we have both mast or those acorns and the leaves. Then we have Osage orange again, sumac and poison ivy. And then the same thing over here, acorns, oak leaves, sumac and poison ivy, hedge trees, and buckbrush. So there's lots of other plants that can be browsed for deer, but those are, those are four that are selected in every season of the year. And I hope that you realize or notice from this that 
those are all species that that are very very common uh, with the exception of potentially oak trees in almost any area where deer would be present in eastern Kansas. So very abundant food source. So what's the seasonal variation in what deer eat? Well, forbs shown here in green are going to be the main thing that they select in spring and summer when they're available. Forbs are high in protein and they're high in energy. And so they are very, very important during the, that late gestation period and the lactation period for does, and also very important during that antler growth period. Then in the fall, browse really becomes the main component of diet. And then in the winter, oh, excuse me, we also pick up acorns down here. And then in the winter, browse and acorns still the most abundant diet component in the stomach contents of these deer. We pick up grasses here, but this, this was mostly rye wheat complex is how it showed up in the diet of those deer. So probably wheat for the most part. So going back to this nutrition graph, let's think about crude protein and where deer get their crude protein. So again, this is like the maximum amount of protein. This line here at 16% crude protein is the maximum amount of crude protein that bucks need to produce the biggest antlers they can and that does need to produce the best milk they can and so on. So let's think about native plants first that deer select. So these are plants that deer highly select that occur naturally. Pokeweed, 33% crude protein. So double the requirement for deer. Hairy aster, another weed. 24% or 23%. Prickly lettuce, weed everybody probably has it in their garden. Highly selected by deer and greatly exceeds the protein requirements. Blackberries exceeds the protein requirements by quite a bit. Again, highly selected. Partridge pea, very, very common in the road ditches and any disturbed native prairie you might see, beggar's ticks. So these are, are the big sort of shepherd's purse shaped stick tights that you might get on you out in the prairie or in the timber. Again, almost double the protein requirement for wild deer. Ragweeds, very important wildlife food that you don't have to work very hard to get. Golden rods, right at that 16% level and wild grapes, about 20%. So deer are adapted to select these species that are very, very high in protein and very high in energy. They go out there and they eat the stuff that is getting them their requirements. And there are lots of things that naturally occur, lots of plants that naturally occur that deer select that will get them all the protein requirements that they need. You might be saying, well, what about this January to March period, and what about during the rut, November and December? Well, browse, if we look at the browse component from another study, exceeds, greatly exceeds the protein requirements in the periods when forbs aren't available. And then let's get rid of all that, those native forbs. We haven't even talked about the, the agricultural crops that are on the landscape that you probably see deer using. So winter wheat is gonna be available from August until April, about 25% crude protein. And that, that's collected, that's from a sample collected in March from a bunch of, of winter wheat. And so that's probably the low point for that plant. And then soybeans, more than double the protein requirement for either sex of deer during, during the high demand period. So plentiful protein on the landscape. Let's do the same thing for energy. We're looking at the same plants here. Pokeweed, plenty of energy there. Hairy aster, so for the most part, for most of the time that it's available, it meets the needs of bucks and, and a lot of the needs of does. Prickly lettuce exceeds both. Blackberry 
exceeds both. Beggar's ticks. Ragweeds, goldenrods, and browse. So browse, oops, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong screen. I got ahead of myself. So browse exceeds the needs during this spring, late winter, early spring time period. We have a little gap here in the rut time frame, so November, December, in energy being met by browse, but that doesn't include our, our nut component or that mast component of browse. So if you have acorns, they are jam packed with energy. So they're gonna be way up here. So naturally occurring plants that are out there that you don't have to work very hard to promote are meeting all the energy requirements for deer in every month of the year. But now let's factor in what's out there in terms of agricultural crops. Winter wheat, 75% energy. And this is total digestible nutrients. Soybeans, basically at the cutoff for those lactating does and exceeding the needs for bucks. So really, for the most part, if you're in this part of the country, food plots aren't needed. So should you plant them? Well, it depends on what your goals are. If, if you are intending to plant something that is going to elevate the nutritional plane of your, of your area to try and grow bigger antlers on deer, and to try and have healthier fawns and all these sorts of things, then you're, you, you don't need to do that. And, and then the other thing is you can increase the nutritional plane for much less money and for much less effort by doing many other habitat management strategies that will provide cover and food at the same time by promoting those naturally occurring plants that I talked about. So the reason to plant food plots in this part of the country is to make animal movements more predictable. And really a kill plot is a more accurate term if you're thinking about planting something for Kansas. If you're trying to get a critter in front of a deer stand or in front of a blind so that someone can harvest that animal or so that someone can take a picture of it. So food plots probably concentrate deer but they don't produce more deer in this part of the country. And like I said, managing native vegetation, managing deer densities, and waiting to harvest bucks until they're old are the best things that you can do to try and grow big deer. Age is the single most influential factor for antler size in deer. Because if a deer doesn't get to be five and a half to seven and a half years old, they are never going to have antlers that are as big as they have the potential to produce. Another way to think about this or sort of something else to think about are fed deer, deer, wild deer. So we've got this continuum from wild deer to domestic deer down here and different things that someone might do to manage for those deer along that continuum. So we've got habitat management practices like managing existing cover for native vegetation, water, planting stuff, population monitoring, putting feeders out, supplemental feeding, predator control, all the way down vaccines, breeding, artificial insemination, cloning, fencing, private ownership. So if you're managing habitat, if you're putting high fences up, those sorts of things, you're somewhere along this continuum. And I'm not promoting one thing over the other. I'm not saying one's good or bad, but Think about where on this continuum do you want the deer that you harvest to be? So given everything I just told you, you still want to plant food plots. So how do you decide what to plant? Well, because in Kansas, we're really focusing mostly on planting kill plots or plots that, that are designed to get a critter in front of a hunter, then a cool season food plot is going to achieve the goals of most hunters. 
And when we look at side-by-side -side plantings of our cool season cereal grains, oats, rye, triticale, and winter wheat, that's the order that deer select them in, oats down to winter wheat. But winter wheat is always selected, even in the presence of the other three. And my recommendation is winter wheat is something that we know how to grow in Kansas. We're really good at it. And it's not really hard to find somebody that can help you figure out how to plant winter wheat if you don't know how. Winter wheat is something that deer are going to use regardless of what's around you. So winter wheat is my suggestion for a very useful cool season food plot to stick in front of a, 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 a tree stand or to put a tree stand by that you can hunt over. If you still think you need to, to provide warm season forage that is going to benefit deer in some way during the summertime, soybeans are selected over all other warm season plantings that are used in food plots. Just plant soybeans. You can get Roundup Ready soybeans. They're very easy to manage. And we also know how to grow those very well in Kansas. If you're worried about that gap between when the winter wheat is harvested and or goes to seed and, and when you be able to plant soybeans, then Ladino clover or chicory can fill that gap and are both very high quality plants that are selected. Um, one thing that we don't talk about a lot is just providing, rather than thinking about providing food plots or planting a food plot, if you're on a farm that's already producing wheat, then, then hunt the wheat fields. If you're on a farm that has soybeans, then rather than going to the effort of planting soybeans in a food plot, just leave a combine strip around the edge of the field unharvested. That is super high energy, super high protein feed that deer will feed on all winter long. So it's, it's already out there. You haven't gone to the extra effort of planting a new crop and that, that's a very easy thing that you can do. Commercial seed mixes. So there are, are a gajillion commercial seed mixes advertised out there and there's never been one shown to produce everything a deer needs all year long and, and be selected by deer all year long. In the, in the trials that are done on commercial seed mixes, the, the results are usually relatively poor. And that's because they're often offered as a mix of small and large seeds. So I'm not putting any brands up here because I don't want to talk bad about anybody. We've got one mix that I looked at Austrian winter peas, brassicas, clovers, winter wheat, and oats. Another mix, cool season cereal grains. So that's going to be wheat, oats, maybe rye, annual clovers, deer radish, and brassicas. So we've got a very large seed. Winter wheat and oats are fairly large seeds. And then we've got these little bitty tiny brassica seeds and clover seeds. Same thing down here. So just talking about which ones are which, wheat, rye, oats, peas, soybeans, corn, sorghum, all those sorts of large seeds need a planting depth of about one inch and really, really good seed to soil contact. Small seeds like clovers, lespedeza, alfalfa, millet, brassicas, and radishes, they need a quarter inch or less. And so if you're planting with a drill or a planter, then some of the seeds end up too deep, some of them end up too shallow. Another issue along with this stuff is there's the small seeds will migrate to the bottom of the hopper and then you end up planting all your small seed in one part of your food plot and all your big seed in another part of the food plot. And so you get this real uneven distribution and you still have some of it that's planted at the wrong depth. Broadcasting together leads to the same issues with depth, either some's too shallow or some's too deep. So if you want to have a, a seed mix, then the best thing to do is to use a drill or broadcast your large seed. And if you used a drill, then, then your next step's gonna be to broadcast 
your small seed back over the top and then cultipack it. If you broadcasted the first time, if you broadcasted your large seed, then all you need to do is, is scratch back over it to, to get it underneath the soil and then cultipack it and then broadcast your small seed and cultipack that. So it's very, very important to conduct that soil test and fertilize as you need to. Nitrogen is, is a crucial factor in the protein content of any of the forage that you produce. And phosphorus, as we showed, is very important for deer at different times of the year. So this is a study on deer in, in Mississippi. So we can see we're just looking at, at this, the black bar in these box plots. So plant selection by deer. And then we've got a control plot that didn't have fertilizer, just regular old NPK fertilizer, lime, and then lime and fertilizer. Deer selected the, the fertilized plots over the unfertilized plots. And this very tightly tracked phosphorus content in the plants in those plots. So deer in this study with poor soil nutrients were selecting plants for phosphorus and also for protein. So how much does a deer eat? How big a plot should you plant? Or between two and 4% of their body weight in dry matter each day. So 150 pound deer is gonna eat about four and a half pounds of dry forage or 18 pounds of growing corn every day. That comes up to a little less than a ton and a half of forage per year. Most hunting plots are somewhere around a quarter to an acre. That's because we want those animals to be foraging in that plot close enough that we can harvest them. We don't want them to be two, 300 yards away. We want them to be right in front of us. So we need small plots. That small plot is not gonna provide anywhere near enough forage to feed deer throughout the year. If you're trying to affect herd nutrition, you need larger plots somewhere around two to five acres. And really, if you're going to try to affect nutrition and have warm season and cool season and all those sorts of things, you, 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 you're best off having cool season plots that are separate from your warm season plots and managing them differently. So in summary, a diverse native landscape with forbs and woody plants should provide all the necessary nutrients that deer need. And most of Kansas includes great diversity in vegetation, including rangelands, woodlands, and croplands. Manage for browse, mast, and forbs while providing cover. So there's lots of practices that I don't have time to talk to that we can use for timber management where you can maximize both your food and the cover in the timber with very little work. Also, think about your neighbors. Deer can easily become overabundant. You may want to produce deer to hunt, but they may be causing damage on your neighbor's property because they're concentrating on that food source. So be prepared to harvest the deer herd if needed and be a good neighbor. So with that, I'll take any questions. If anybody has any questions, if they uh, either want to turn their mics off and ask Drew themselves, or if they just want to put it down in the chat. Um, Drew, I guess I'll say uh, you, the one crop you didn't mention was uh, standing corn or field corn. And I know, speaking from experience, the edges of our field corn showed heavy deer pressure this last, uh, this last summer. Yeah, yeah. Standing standing corn is a is a great crop for deer. Uh, we don't talk about it as much because it's mainly an energy source. Um, it it's it's most folks are are really worried about providing uh, protein, and you know there's there's typically enough corn on the landscape that we've got plenty of that out there, and and deer definitely like it. 
All righty. Well, uh, I'm not seeing any uh, other. Ryan, oh. I had a quick question. What, what about uh, they really like alfalfa and red clover or clover to, uh, that's, as long as we got some of that by the highway up here, they're usually back by the creek instead of up on the road. So that, that's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, they definitely will select those plants. And, you know, the, the perennial forage plots are much more difficult for most hunters to manage. And you get much more bang for your buck out of the, the annual forage crops if you're going to plant something for deer because you, you're going to have less of an issue with weed control um, oftentimes a lot less fertilizing issues and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, for, for, for most of our hunters, um, wheat and soybeans will get them about anything they need. And, and I, I suggest to most people that they probably don't need to plan anything, that there's lots of other things that we can do that, that, uh, provide better nutrition and last longer than, than even the perennial plots. You know, your soybeans, I, there was an extension program in South Carolina with, with Clemson and they, those deer were decimating soybeans. <laughs> even, I mean, even the ripe ones, I mean, you wouldn't have thought of it, but, and I've seen them eat ripe or sunflowers down to a broomstick too. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, if they can find something that's, and that's high in protein with a lot of oil, they really like that, I guess. Yep. So. For sure. Yeah. There was, they had a small, they had some small soybean fields on Kanza one summer <laughs> when I was doing my PhD research and there was a drought and, and they were grubbed down to the ground. I mean, there, there wasn't a, wasn't a soybean produced out there. It looked like they'd been harvested and they were still green. All righty. Well, I uh, still haven't got any questions. If you guys think of questions later, please give uh, Darren, Rod or myself a call um, and we can either get you in touch with Drew or, or get the answer from Drew and get back with you. Um, I do want to thank everybody for joining us, whether it was on Facebook Live or joining us live uh, this evening. So uh, thank you, uh, Stu, Bruno, and Drew for joining us this evening and uh, I, you know, all the information.